Hello, everyone. Welcome or welcome back to the Dialects Card Podcast, a podcast targeted to the youth, where we critically engage in philosophy and correlate philosophy research to contemporary and social issues, all at an easy to understand and digestible level. My name is Sara Shivasava, and I'm your host. This week, we're joined by Dr. Bailey Thomas, who is currently a postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Philosophy um, at, the, at Dartmouth University. Uh, while on research leave from the University of Louisville, where they are an assistant professor of philosophy. Hi, Dr. Thomas. How are you today? Good. How are you? Uh, pretty good. Quite quite early this morning, though. Uh, <laughs> but thank you for your time and for being here today. Uh, before we begin our discussion on some really interesting topics, um, I asked all my guests this question, and I wanted to ask you as well. How did you get into philosophy, and what stood out to you? Well, um you know, as an academic, my journey to philosophy was not very traditional, um, like some of my peers. So when I first went to undergrad, I was actually um, on the pre-med track and I was a psychology major. And then after the first week of classes um, in the fall term, when I took my first philosophy class, I switched my major over to philosophy after we started reading um, one of the Socratic dialogues. And what really attracted me to the discipline is really just the way that it allows um, folks from all parts of both the humanities and even social sciences and the hard sciences to really engage in authentic um, inquiry, ask questions, and you're never really punished for asking too many questions like you may be in other, in other disciplines. So, um, with that, the other reason that I got into the discipline largely, especially as an academic now, has to do with my grandmother. So she was the first Black woman to get her PhD in philosophy from Vanderbilt University in December 1991. And I actually didn't find out about that until I was applying to colleges and um, learned about her graduate work and um, you know the different uh, institutions that she she taught at before she retired early for health reasons. So when it came time to really thinking about what I wanted to do um, after leaving undergrad, I heavily considered um, philosophy alongside other graduate degrees and eventually applied and was accepted into Penn State's program. And it pretty much took off from there. So what like types of questions were you interested in in like your undergrad years and your graduate years and how has that kind of like shaped your research now? So I was really interested in um, better understanding the world, honestly. And I know that's, that's a very you know cheesy answer, but um, the specific track that I chose as a philosophy major was one that emphasized social justice. I went to a Jesuit school, Loyola University, Chicago, and anyone who you know, has gone to a Jesuit school knows that social justice is really at the forefront um, in your education at those institutions. So I was really curious how you know, philosophy and philosophical thinking could help with various um, societal problems, such as anti-Black racism, and that was the focus of my undergraduate thesis and a lot of my doctoral work, and thinking about how um, you know, knowledge and knowledge practices in particular are helpful for um, expanding our imaginations and really helping us, you know, think about how liberation can be um, a reality instead of just a dream. And so sorts some of the questions that came as a result of that um, are really based in a lot of my current interests with um, critical philosophy of race, Black American, um, feminist theory and, um, you know, the adjacent fields. And a lot of that had to do with the um, instructor that I had in my junior year at Loyola, Jacqueline Scott. She was the only um, Black woman in the department. I want to say also the only person of color as well at that time. And it was during her class, and uh, I think it was called Philosophy of Race, where I actually read non-white people um, in a philosophy class for the first time. So that was really pivotal for me and helped me realize that, you know, this degree could actually do something instead of, you know, just allow me to think about questions and, and write papers. And it was actually um, really um, 
it was really a starting point for thinking about how philosophy can um, go hand in hand with community activism. And that was another thing that I was heavily involved in when I was um, in Chicago during those four years. So when you say like community activism, do you mean like within the space itself, like in terms of uh, bringing more diversity or like bringing up questions, like you mentioned, like reading non-white philosophy or like non-white scholarship, um, like is that type of like community activism within philosophy or are you acting like, are you, sorry, are you mentioning about like, um, like maybe how philosophy has impacted actual like social movements or stuff like that? Um, so now that you asked the question, both, I was thinking more so the latter. So I was involved in a lot of community activism on my campus. Um, we had a large, um, I mean, after Laquan McDonald, um, when that case was ongoing in 2016, there was a lot of um, activism on campus surrounding the police state. Loyola's campus was heavily policed at the time. And as far as I know, still is. We also had a lot of discussions, hard discussions around, um, you know, the the way in which the Black Studies program at the time was being actively phased out. So, what sorts of you know traditions and disciplines were being valued, and what were being undervalued, and also um, doing some, you know, community activism with the local community. So, I did a couple of projects with some local nonprofits. Um, working with undocumented folks, some things with Asada's Daughters, which is a um, activist group based in Chicago, um, rooted in the teachings of Asada um, Shakur and, you know, some other uh, groups here and there. But within the field, you can definitely see social justice operating within, you know, just the basic components of a syllabus, for example. So syllabi are very political, whether it's in philosophy or not. And the people that you have in your syllabus matter, the topics that you cover matter, and what philosophy, you know, if done um, wholeheartedly and intentionally can do is allow us to really think about the ways in which all of these disciplines, English, um, political theory, um, psychology, biology, so on and so forth, how they're all in conversation with each other and allows us also to open up our network for thinking about, you know, what sorts of scholars do we want to include in our discussions and in, in the classroom and also in our research too. Right, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, and it kind of bleeds into like what I'm about to ask you next in the context of like, what types of questions should we be asking? So what are like some of the types of like key ethical questions and ethical ethical and political like challenges and questions that society faces today? Um, and how can philosophy help us address these challenges, uh, both maybe in like an armchair philosophy sense, but also like in terms of an activism type of sense? So immediately when I saw this question, I thought, mm -hmm everything's an issue, right? The world is literally on fire right now. So it's kind of hard to, to pinpoint, you know, key ethical and political issues, but certainly in the United States, um, one of the number one issues right now, of course, is the discussion of body politics and, and rights. So not just in terms of, you know, the rights of pregnant people being able to terminate pregnancy um, for various reasons, but also thinking about the ways in which um, those who you know, don't meet the stereotypical body standards, how are they treated in society, especially medically? Um, so fat phobia, of course, is discussed in terms of popular culture, especially within, you know, the fashion industry and things like that. But um, what a lot of fat people are talking about now is the fact that, you know, when they go to the doctor, they're literally denied, you know, life-saving health care because the first thing that the, um, you know, medical official wants to say is that you just need to lose weight. And there have been many people coming forward now with, um, you know, stories telling about how they even had, you know, cancer scares totally misdiagnosed or not even discussed because the doctor thinks that a lot of these symptoms are because of um, being overweight. Um, I mean, alongside that, we have just the, you know, general matrix of oppression that's occurring um, from being in a white supremacist, patriarchal capitalist system. So um, looking at issues like 
police violence, um, class issues, you know, the ethics of, you know, basic income, for example, right? If we want to say that in the United States, we are pro-life, what does it mean to actually be that beyond just saying, you know, we don't want people to terminate pregnancy? Do we want to support a right to education? Do we want to support an actual living wage that allows people to, you know, not just live, but thrive and be able to lead fulfilling lives that aren't just based around working around the clock until they're 65 or so, hopefully. Um, we've seen many cases now where people in their late 70s and 80s have had to return to the workforce because they literally can't afford to retire. Um, you know, and I think alongside that, probably the biggest issue for me, and this is um, really where my research is rooted in, is the question about knowledge and the way in which as a whole, there's a general unwillingness to think critically and to really face, um, you know, knowledge claims and, and uh, you know, other, you know, individuals that have different um, perspectives and, and viewpoints. So, you know, being in higher education, a lot of academics, of course, are, are worried about bills that are coming out of Florida and Texas and other more conservative states really limiting, you know, what it is that you're able to discuss in the classroom. And that's not, of course, just on, you know, a K to 12 level, but also really restricting what sorts of topics and even people that we can have on our syllabi and also affecting, you know, what sort of research can we do? How would that be funded? And, you know, so on and so forth. And I think that, you know, this connects to a lot of the other issues that I mentioned in the way that a lot of individuals are now really confronting the fact that knowledge, the pursuit of knowledge is not always a happy one. Knowledge can sometimes make us uncomfortable. It can have negative effects on us. And in many ways, we all want to be comfortable, right? We all want um, our certain beliefs to be validated, whether regardless of you know, what political spectrum we find ourselves on. And what I'm seeing right now, especially as an educator, is really um, the way that you know, shame and guilt really spur people to become very you know, headstrong in their beliefs to the point where no matter what sort of evidence you're able to give them, it just makes them even more um, rooted in the beliefs that they have. So I think um, really, on that note, we're kind of at a pivotal time in society and really thinking about how, um, you know, the next few moves that we make over, um, you know, maybe three to five years or so and how that's going to radically shape the future that, you know, you all are going to grow up in, especially when you start <laughs> going to college and then entering the workforce. Yeah, I think that makes sense. And like the point you had about like critical thinking, uh, makes the most sense to me in my opinion just because like that's something I think we see uh, kind of like generation by generation um, there's like a lack of almost like critical thinking um, recently and um, with a lot of the decisions that you see like both in a political aspect but also just socially you can kind of see that and hopefully the podcast is a way to like engage in more critical thinking but also like you know with your research that focuses on like integrating the ethical and political frameworks into social epistemology. Um, I guess, like, what does that mean to inject these perspectives into social epistemology? And like, why is it necessary? Is it just because of the critical thinking aspect about like making more or making people aware that like knowledge could be uncomfortable, but rather that pursuit of knowledge is still more important? Um, or what exactly is the reason behind like injecting those frameworks into social epistemology? That's a really good question. And, you know, a lot of this has to do with, um, I mean, there are disciplinary reasons for doing so. And then there are also, you know, social reasons. So in, you know, in a nutshell, disciplinary um, reasons are really based on the history of social epistemology forming in the field. So traditional epistemology um, has long been thought of as really just the study of knowledge and the pursuit of knowledge based on an individual perspective. So until the, I don't know, um, early 70s, maybe late 60s, um, you don't really see a lot of discussion around knowledge production um, among groups, even small groups, right? 
So what social epistemology does is really think about the ways in which, you know, knowledge is not performed in a vacuum, right? It's, or rather, it's not gained in a vacuum. We're always interacting with people. We're always interacting with groups. And nowadays, it's even more complex, you know, given social media, right? And in this case, you and I are in completely different parts of the country, yet we're able to have, you know, a fulfilling epistemic exchange because we now have the ability to interact and speak with so many people. In terms of, you know, social reasons um, why we want to think about these ethical and political frameworks in, in our knowledge practices, it's, it's mainly because if we want to say that we're, you know, good moral people, and I think most people want to say that even if they don't actually believe they are, right, we, act, we need to think about how our epistemic practices and customs can be harmful to other people, especially if they have marginalized identities. So um, there are several texts that kind of explain this. Um, the most notable one is uh, Epistemic Injustice by Miranda Fricker. Um, it's a little bit, you know, uh, heavy with the terminology, but essentially what Fricker argues is that, you know, as social beings and as people that are, you know, engaged in very complex hierarchies of, you know, dominance, oppression, so on and so forth, we have to always be aware of the effect that um, the way in which we know about the world and other people in it, how that can be oppressive for other people, or in Fricker's words, you know, really commit acts of epistemic injustice. So the pursuit of knowledge, you know, in this way is, is not an objective experience, as you know, sort of argued with traditional analytic epistemology. And it's actually quite common for all of us to commit acts of epistemic injustice against each other because these practices are so deeply ingrained in our society, you know, it's really almost second nature for us to do them. And it's not until we are actually, you know, stopped and, you know, question about these practices and, you know, dig a little bit deeper that we see the way in which um, these harms are performed. And one common example, um, that most people have experienced or witnessed at least is testimonial injustice that occurs with the police. So testimonial justice is this idea that I am wronging someone in their capacity as a knower because I'm denying the certain um, epistemic claims that they're espousing to me. So it's usually based in some sort of identity prejudice. So the more um, socially marginalized identity someone has, the less likely I am to believe them. So it's not just that I don't want to listen to their testimony. The fact that I don't believe them is also signaling a lack of trust and a trust, lack of trust in both that person and often in the community that they come from. And likewise, if someone has, you know, um, highly desirable social identities or social identities that hold a dominant position in the society that they're in, they get more credibility, even if they don't even deserve it. So oftentimes in the United States, um, we're all taught, especially if you are coming from, you know, a white American community to trust the police. Many folks in that community, um, for the large part, right, they don't have negative experiences with the police or the police state. Yet, if you're someone like me, right, growing up as a kid, you have the talk with your parents, which is essentially, you know, you can't always trust the police. You can't always trust law enforcement to you know, do what's in your best interest. And that's based on a history of racialized violence. But a lot of, you know, for many people, you know, that knowledge is not so much hidden, but it's really, it's not on the forefront of their minds because they don't have that direct experience with it. And the problem comes in with that many people when, you know, they're confronted with you know, testimonies of police violence, they don't seek to know more about it. They immediately shut down and become rigid in their views. And that is an ethical issue that, you know, needs to be addressed if we want to actually, you know, have a democratic society and have a society where we can say that we're intentionally trying to, you know, um, address issues of oppression and injustice. So instead of, you know, injecting these ethical and political frameworks, rather what I, I want to say is that they need to be at the forefront of our minds whenever we are constructing epistemic frameworks and ways of knowing. 
Because if you just inject it into the system as it is, what often happens is the oppression, um, you know, how it manifests may be slightly different, but it's still there. And usually, right, if we want to think about, um, you know, actual radicality in terms of social change, oftentimes what needs to be done is actually deconstructing the system as a whole and starting anew. That's a lot of work and it's a lot of commitment and there's a lot of unknowability there and uncertainty, but um, usually very, very unlikely that sort of just mixing in some ethics with the current system as it stands, if it's if the system itself is problematic, it's very unlikely that um, the epistemic injustice and oppression that's occurring is really going to change. Yeah, I think that makes a, like a lot of sense. And then also in the context of like philosophy as well, um, a lot of the questions are, or like a lot of the theories um, have like, I mean, some of the most like widely accepted theories can also have problems in that they're not necessarily like aligned with everyone's interest in mind. Um, and I think a lot of the recent research, research and like literature in a lot of these fields are like highlighting those things that like widely accepted theories are like problematic too. Um, which goes back to your point about how like dominance and like kind of having a lot of power uh, often means that you can kind of spew information that's not necessarily the best or even accurate sometimes. Um, I want to shift the conversation a little bit to kind of like your dissertation about like knowing while black insidious ignore ignorance ignorance and oppositional knowledge um, and in this you know you define like this term insidious ignorance so what exactly is that and how can it maybe be defined in like social structures um, like are there examples of this within the current political system or is this something that just exists within philosophy so definitely not something that's just within philosophy um, so when I started that dissertation many years ago, <laughs> um, I was really working with uh, Charles Mills and his notion of the racial contract. And um, Mills talks about this in the book by the same title, published, I think, in 97. And he essentially argues that the way that society is structured in the West, particularly the United States, is structured around um, a social contract, which is a contract that um, you enter a lot of times um, involuntarily just on the basis of you being within that specific society. So social contract theory goes you know, way back to modern philosophy, um, usually seen with John Locke, uh, so Kant, so on and so forth. Um, also Thomas Hobbes, and it's based on this idea that the practices and norms in a society are based on the social contract, which is, you know, agreed by being in this commonwealth or, you know, um, society. Um, and it essentially guides our everyday actions, especially our ethical and political concerns. So Mills, um, you know, comes into this discussion and essentially says that we need to be very critical about the social contract for various reasons, but, you know, his main point is that it is not at all the case that all subjects within, you know, the commons are treated equally, nor is it the case that, you know, those who are, who designed the social contract had all of the inhabitants in mind. And so Mills specifically says that race is perhaps, you know, the leading factor within um, within the social contract. And when he says that, he means that, you know, the idea of race and racism is contractually, you know, woven into the fabric of our society. So racism doesn't, you know, just exist on the horizon of our society, or it's not just at the edges, but it's literally built into every single thing that we do. And there are other theories that, you know, complement this idea, such as critical race theory, actual critical race theory, you know, within the legal system. So this idea that the legal system is inherently racist because it's built on, you know, an understanding of the law and, you know, the, um, the idea that, you know, non-white subjects are inherently less moral, so on and so forth. All of, you know, a lot of these ideas are seen in Mills's conception. 
And so during you know, the research that I conducted for the dissertation, at the time I was trying to better understand exactly how it is that white supremacy is able to persist for so long. So in the radical black tradition, I mean, people have talked about white supremacy for decades, you know, centuries at this point, even if it wasn't termed white supremacy as such, you still see that notion um, constantly reappear in, in the literature. So upon further reflection and, um, you know, thinking, what I realized is that there has to be some other group that is responsible for allowing, you know, white supremacy to not just continue to persist, but also um, mutate in many ways, right, in terms of its manifestation. And so when I conceptualize insidious ignorance, I essentially state that it's a parasitic and mutually beneficial relationship between those who are willfully ignorant and those who have a high amount of social credibility and consciously lie, but claim these lies to be you know, true beliefs that they hold. And so those who are willfully ignorant um, are usually sort of classified in two categories. Um, so the first category is that they you know, intentionally um, ignore or dismiss knowledge claims that they know will have a negative effect on them. So, you know, the concept of white guilt, for example, is, is based on this. Um, or they might be ignoring um, some of these knowledge claims because they know that if they acknowledge them, then they'll lose certain, um, you know, social power that they have. So that's where the mutually beneficial aspect comes in here. Those that you know are forming this lie, you know, this lying entity, they also want power. They also want control. And so the lies that they espouse are not meant to, they're not targeted at the entire population. They're directed at a very specific population that for, you know, again, various reasons might be susceptible to these lies. So a common example that I discuss um, when explaining this theory is, is Trumpism. So if you think about, you know, the large um, white American public, a lot of, you know, um, working class and poor white Americans who, um, you know, held strongly and some still hold very strongly to Trump's beliefs um, is because that that group for the longest time, many of them from, you know, when they were young children had been taught that certain you know, minority and ethnic groups don't work hard, they live off the government, they take jobs away from hard earning, you know, hardworking white Americans. And this is, you know, this rhetoric is, is seen all the way back to um, the reconstruction era in the United States and even further. So these groups that are already, you know, predisposed to these beliefs are more likely than other groups to, you know, believe them to be true. Even if you show them statistics, for example, that the you know highest um, group that tends to be on social benefits of any kind are, are white Americans, right? They'll claim that this is um, you know fake news or something like that because they want to hold on to their beliefs because for them it gives them some sort of social power or advantage over other groups. So when you know it comes to how, when it comes to how this is seen in society, you can see it in the medical industry, right? Think back to, you know, the debate, even current debate over COVID vaccines and boosters. We see it in politics all the time. A lot of political rhetoric is designed to really target certain groups that are susceptible to, um, you know, being, uh, um, being really, you know, engaged and also um, not mystified, but really, you know, uh, just enamored with a lot of these political beliefs because they believe that those who have this high amount of social credibility, if they, you know, give some of their power to, to them, then they'll be able to have, you know, a higher sort of dominance over um, other non-white groups. So that's just, you know, of course, insidious ignorance and a racial concept or, or in a racial light. 
But whenever you have some sort of group that has a high amount of social credibility and a high amount of social trust as well, you're usually likely to see um, some sort of manipulation um, of those who are willfully ignorant, whether they're conscious of it or not. Great, I think that makes sense. And I guess like there, like my question is uh, about like insidious ignorance, is it just like recognition that this exists or is there like a strategy you presented um, in ways of changing that? Like i.e., uh, let's say there's someone who has been like since a very young age has been introduced to like wrongful information about the police or something like that. Uh, and now they're in a place where they're experiencing or at least seeing or presented with information or statistics about the opposite, right, uh, of what they believed, but they're reluctant to believe in it because they've been brought up for such a long time to not believe in that, right? So does insidious ignorance or like at least your dissertation and your research now focus on a way of like combating that or is this just like addressing that this issue exists in society um, and that like it's probably a lot bigger of a problem than we originally imagined? So insidious ignorance is really just describing, you know, that relationship between um, those who consciously lie and those who are willfully ignorant. But the larger research project is, is essentially first trying to establish that this relationship exists. And the, one of the reasons why this work is so hard, especially when it comes to, you know, how do we know if there is an insidiously ignorant relationship ongoing? A lot of times um, these relationships don't make themselves visible to you know, the larger society until it's too late. So there's some sort of tragic event that's occurred, you know, um, January 6th, right? Many politicians on the right refuse to believe for the longest time that the rhetoric that Trump and his um, you know, um, supporters were espousing was actually harmful until you know, the Capitol literally came under a cap attack in what was a coup. You know, people didn't call it a coup, but that's that's essentially what it was, right? You have a large, you know, number of people who think that the election was stolen, even though we now have, you know, several pundits and Fox News admitting that they knew there was no, you know, there were no, um, there, were, there was no falsification of any electoral results, yet they knew that this group so strongly believed in it that if they continue to manipulate them, they would gain, you know, some sort of social prominence and power from doing so. So admitting and acknowledging this phenomenon is, is going to be very important before we can talk about any, you know, forms of, of remedy for it. When it comes to thinking about how to address this issue, one, one thing that immediately comes to mind is that we have to really think about how epistemic virtues can play a role here. So um, by virtues, I'm pulling from Jose Medina's uh, work and Ian James Kidd, where they talk about how there are certain virtues or attitudes that are helpful when it pertains to you know, engaging in knowledge with other people. And one of those virtues is epistemic curiosity. It's good to be curious, right? It's good to think critically about certain standpoints that we have and that, you know, those of other people. So whether, um, you know, you're just, if, for example, if we take a classroom um, setting, if I'm discussing a certain concept or reading with students and let's say a majority or almost all of them agree, you know, it's not enough to just say, I agree with this. We have to really think about what it is that we're agreeing with what sorts of values is this reading um, articulating and how does that agree with you know, current beliefs that I hold? And then from there, you know, think, well, why is it that I hold these beliefs? What makes my position better or more advantageous than the other positions that are out there to also explain or address this phenomenon? So it's not always about you know, presenting evidence to people. So, the, you know, in psychology, there's this concept called the backfire effect, which is essentially where you can tell someone or show them statistics, data, what have you, personal testimony, that the position that they have is wrong or harmful, and they'll still believe it. So what I think really has to be addressed in those instances, and that's really um, 
I think the most important one because that's where we see, you know, a lot of these um, strongly held political beliefs, especially um, taking a role here, is trying to get people to be more curious, to be, you know, to have humility and understand that they they don't know everything. And it's also possible that, you know, the people that um, they respect and, you know, go to for knowledge, for example, your teacher, your professor, they also don't know everything either. And it's really on us to think, um, to engage in an epistemic pursuit that's genuine and to really assess the, you know, the different positions that we have and the different resources that are being presented to us. Yeah, I think um, that's really interesting. And, um, you know, I think like also just on this topic of like knowledge and pursuit of knowledge, there's a lot of things that students can do outside of just asking their teacher, <laughs> like um, like individual research. And that's actually one of the things that um, I think now has recently, at least in English curriculums, at least here, um, recently taken off is that like English has served more as a purpose of like uh, kind of getting kids to think more about their position in society as opposed to just thinking about English works. So mm -hmm. there's been like a larger focus on like the self and how like we contribute to questions uh, or like to the topics, et cetera, which I think is a really good way of learning and also a good way of teaching um, because that kind of gets students involved um, in learning and then also like recognizing where uh, they're kind of like stereotypes fall are false or like right. where certain views are negative or also false. Um, so I think there's a lot of you know benefit in external research that could also apply to kind of your topic of insidious ignorance in terms of like combating that um, because you know there's ways like it, I guess ultimately pursuit of knowledge is what matters the most as as long as the knowledge is like accurate and also like you know you're not willing we, I don't know, negating it or whatever it might be, right? Um, and I want to talk a little bit about like your work uh, with, you know, like kind of, you know, African-American political philosophy, Black feminist theory, and also, the, you know, the Black radical tradition. So how do like these traditions and kind of like these theories uh, inform your conception of insidious ignorance? I know you talked about Charles Mills um, kind of racial contract and like, uh, I, I guess th that kind of like helped you, but also like what other things um, do you draw from these theories um, and how do they help kind of like your uh, your writing and your research now? Um, so for me, um, you know, when I was in graduate school and even in undergrad, I had no formal education in these various topics and, and issues. So, you know, to what you were just saying about the pursuit of knowledge, right? A lot of, a lot of times the way that folks become experts um, in this work is you know, just doing a large independent study with yourself. So after I, um, after that philosophy of race class that I took, I think in undergrad, I started reading more African-American literature and political theory. So, you know, no hardcore textbooks or anything like that, but, you know, looking at novels um, and social commentary from folks like James Baldwin, Audre Lorde, Toni Morrison, um, and extending that into my graduate um, coursework when I would take classes, um, you know, based on phenomenology, right? So instead of just looking at Heidegger, Husserl, um, or Malou-Ponty, you know, thinking about Franz Fanon, right? And the, you know, Black phenomenology that he's, he's discussing and also, you know, seeking out the work of other scholars who do, um, you know, work adjacent to those topics that I'm looking at. So when I, I mean, when it comes to the Black radical tradition, what I think is so special about all of the, the works, you know, can, canonical and non-canonical is that there are so many different theories and ideas and concepts around, you know, mainly circling around this question um, directed towards Black people throughout the diaspora, which is, you know, what does it mean to be free and, and how do we get free? And, you know, there are so many debates and, you know, um, controversies within the discipline, especially when it comes to, um, you know, the question of obligation and, and ethics of care, right? So, 
am I obligated to um, defend every single black person or am I able to, you know, say, you know, all right, I don't, you know, mess around with these certain individuals. And that is certainly a discussion when it comes to people like R. Kelly and Bill Cosby, who have played large roles in, you know, Black popular culture, but have committed very serious, you know, ethical injustices and, and atrocities. Um, so, you know, regarding insidious ignorance, what I use these works to express, um, particularly when I'm discussing the racial formations of, of this relationship, I want to demonstrate that it's not really necessary to rely on other, you know, scholars and other um, frameworks, primarily within Western philosophy, when you have Black scholars saying the same thing, if not sometimes more articulate and also much earlier than you see a lot of this other um, theorization um, happening in, you know, larger, um, in the larger Western philosophy, um, you know, philosophy world. So less of a reliance on frameworks and scholars, you know, who may talk about race or talk about racism and anti-Blackness, but do so primarily with non-Black authors and scholars. So I think there's a really strong, um, point that's made when you not just talk about these issues, but really take seriously and, you know, integrate the voices of those who are directly experiencing this injustice so that you don't create a theory that may, you know, talk about Black people, but doesn't actually encompass Black bodies and Black lives. And there's a really strong difference between the two. Okay, I think that makes sense. But like, I guess in that scenario, I'm also interested or like curious about the way that like non-Black people should engage. Uh, within the BRT, like, what does it mean to be an ally and like what role ought they should, like, ought they play? So for me, you know, being an ally is always, you know, something that you do, right? It's not something that you are. So when it comes to allyship and, and you know, the Black radical tradition or even, you know, dominant or rather um, other, you know, marginalized frameworks, it, it really is about you know, taking these practices and taking these authors and texts seriously, just as seriously as you would, you know, other philosophy texts. So oftentimes what I see at conferences and even in articles, um, when folks are engaging with, you know, non-white, non-Western philosophy, um, you know, it, the, the scholarship is very weak in terms of, you know, the research that's done, the um, analysis, is not as rigorous as, um, you know, as it's performed in other parts of the work or even in, in the presentation of, you know, we're thinking about a conference talk. And what that signals, even, you know, if implicitly, is that, you know, this field, these, these scholars are not as serious as these other individuals. Um, and, you know, of course, it's going to be harmful for folks like myself, whose, you know, entire, um, you know, worldview is really shaped largely by these by these various traditions. So when it comes to, you know, how is it that other people who may not identify as black, how can we be an ally in these situations, you know, take the work seriously, right? Engage with it authentically, just like you would in any other case. Um, and really think critically about, you know, what sorts of works or, you know, concepts um, have you learned in other situations that may actually be harmful or neglect um, to include the, the bodies and voices of other you know, marginalized people? So not just, again, trying to just add people of color right to, to the table, but really questioning why is the table there to begin with? And what, how could we really think about, um, how could we think about these issues from an equitable standpoint and really start with inclusion at the basis as opposed to you know just adding these people to um you know syllabi or conversations or anything like that yeah I think that makes a lot of sense um both on like a philosophy level and kind of just in general the way in which like co-option works um seems like there's a really big trend um a lot of like media outlets now um which is like something that's really annoying to me and like kind of concerning with the way in which you see trends to just include racial or something that has no relationship whatsoever like the slightest relationship to the news story that's being presented 
but just to get clips clicks which i guess is just capitalism at play but it goes to show how like the work that cedric robinson has on like black marxism and like just in general about brt kind of like just is true or like it shows itself a lot more uh in society now than even previously when there's like like whole problems with society just way more covert but once you start realizing it it's like really really hard to unsee it Mm -hmm. um just one of like the last few questions that I wanted to ask, like I guess there's two more, but like this, uh, I wanted to ask you about like the roundtable for Black feminist and womanist theory, uh, which you're the founder and director of. What is the purpose in an organ like of this organization slash group? And you know, if there's anyone listening to this podcast who may identify underneath those uh, categories, like what would you want to say to them? Um, so I started the roundtable back in. 2019. Um, we had the first meeting in 2020. Terrible timing because that's, of course, when the pandemic hit, everything was on lockdown. So um, the last, the first two meetings were virtual. And this past November, we actually had the first in person meeting for the third annual meeting. Um, but I started actually in honor of my grandmother. So while she, you know, did a lot of groundbreaking work in Black feminist theory and philosophy of love and sex, in particular, she actually was never able to publish anything. Um, due to a lot of racism and misogyny in the field, she wasn't able to get a tenure track job. She had to work um, full time as a lecturer at Morgan State University and also, um, you know, perform adjunct work at Johns Hopkins, um, Notre Dame University in Maryland, and also Loyola University, Maryland, and a couple of other, you know, schools um, in in the Midwest early on in her career. So, you know, with that, I wanted to really create a space for, um, you know, scholars who are really invested in black feminist and womanist theory to have a space to engage in cross disciplinary conversation and also um, really push and help support those scholars in their publication efforts. So as an academic, right, the way that you secure your job is through tenure. And for most people, tenure is gained on research. So publications like articles, book chapters, um, you know, monographs, or even, you know, edited volumes to a certain extent. And statistically, Black women um, really tend to struggle in this area because we're often overcommitted when it comes to service and teaching. Many of us are the only person in our department who looks like us and also the only person that, you know, specializes in the type of work that we do, which means we get a lot of students, which is great, but, you know, we have a lot more on our plate than some of our other colleagues who, you know, um, have less students interested in their work or less students that are sort of taking some of those gen ed classes where a lot of, you know, the philosophy of race, gender, so on and so forth is first introduced to students at the intro level. So, um, you know, the purpose is really to, you know, provide that space to encourage, um, you know, publication and other, um, you know, uh, intellectual production. But really, it's it's just a nice meeting space and community for folks interested in Black feminist and womanist theory. So in philosophy, there aren't really any spaces dedicated to this. You get maybe a panel or two at a conference, or you may have a subcommittee or something like that. And so I really wanted a space that was intentionally, you know, for folks invested in, in this work. And it's also open to, you know, folks who don't identify as Black women. So anyone can attend, anyone can, you know, tune in into the activities, but in terms of you know the goal is really just centered around anyone who's have you know has some sort of work in progress centered around black feminist or womanist theory. And this can be academic, it can be based in activist work, it can be more so on the artistry side. Um, so most of the people attending are you know graduate students and early career and senior folks, but you know, of course those who are, you know, haven't entered higher ed are certainly welcome to, you know, learn more about the disciplines and really think about, you know, maybe how these theories might be useful for future work that they're doing and also just for their personal life too. 
Yeah, awesome. I will leave a link to the to the website in the description. Um, the past talks have been really interesting. Uh, there's some awesome keynote speakers for the past years, um, like really, really well like accredited too. So definitely check that out. Uh, I did want to ask, like as the last question, what are you doing now? Is it just like running this as well as like the research about like insidious ignorance, or is there any other research that you're doing? So um, I actually just secured a contract with the University of Massachusetts Press. I'm co-editing a volume um, that's really going to serve as a companion to W. E. B. Du Bois's Black Reconstruction in America. So um, a book about you know Black Reconstruction in the United States, or rather the Reconstruction period in the United States and the role that Black Americans had um, during that time period. I'm also working on a, another book manuscript about Black feminist practices and ethics of care. So really um, taking, some, taking some of the concepts from care, ethics, and philosophy. So this idea of you know, thinking about what is care and what is care work? Is it something that's based out of obligation? Are there certain ties? that or connections needed, you know, for this type of work and really um, formalizing an ethics and politics of care from a Black feminist perspective. So I'm looking at um, some scholars who have, you know, um, created core essential concepts, both in, you know, the, you know, academic literature, but also um, some concepts that have, you know, also seep into the, um, activist sphere as well. So those are two projects pretty much taking up my time along with the round table. Um, and of course, you know, other pastime, not academic things. I'm an avid gamer. So getting really into my PS5 right now and finally able to, you know, play some video games and um, do some traveling and things like that now that I'm able to be a bit more mobile with the travel restrictions being lifted. That's awesome. Well, you're going to definitely have to like let me know when that book is out because um, I'll definitely be interested in reading that, the one about Du Bois, because uh, that's like really interesting to me. Um, but that about wraps up our episode today. Thanks so much, Dr. Thomas, for your time today. Um, I learned a lot and I'm sure our audience did as well.